But that very naturally leads to what I call the next principle of delegation. For when people understand what they can do, we need to let them get involved. Give them something that makes them sense that they too are needed. And so Jesus was continually involving his disciples in the ministry that was suited to their own gifts. It happened Jesus didn't own any property, so far as we know. He didn't have his own house when he went out into ministry, so he just lived with his disciples and his friends. It was a beautiful way for them to minister to him. I haven't found anywhere in the Gospels where it tells me Jesus turned down an invitation to dinner. I was glad when I discovered that. <laughs> what a beautiful way for somebody else to be the servant. You see, that's part of it. Finding ways for those that you are trying to help to exercise their own gifts and to feel that sense of importance that they too are a ministering servant. They had been with Jesus for a while. They had made a visit down to Jerusalem. He had talked there with Nicodemus. They were on their way back to Galilee and we were told Jesus was preaching, but the disciples were baptizing. Now that's interesting because when I began to preach, I had not been authorized yet to administer the sacraments. I hadn't finished seminary. I wasn't ordained. And when I ventured out to do this, I was very soon reminded by my superintendent that I was not qualified. Well, of course, I was obedient to authority, and I got the pastor of the big first church in town to come out and baptize my converts. But I couldn't help but smile. I noticed Jesus had his disciples baptizing long before they were ordained. Now I'm not going to press this too far. I may already be in trouble. I'm pouring out a principle, a principle. Get people involved in some way so they feel a part of the ministry. They had been with him for probably a year and a half, maybe two years, when one day they must have stopped along the road and Jesus explained at the rate they were going, they're not going to be able to visit all the villages. But he said, I, I have a new plan in mind. We'll divide up. And you can go out into places yet where I haven't been. It probably scared them to death. They had never done it before on their own. But he said, now don't worry, you don't go by yourself. We're not soloists. We always work together with someone else. So you team up with someone and you will go into a village and do just what you've watched me do. Heal the sick, cast out demons, preach the gospel of the kingdom. Well, they'd been watching Jesus do this. They were prepared. But he added one thing more. When you come into a new town, find the most worthy family, sometimes called a man of peace, and that's where you are to stay as long as you're in that village. That is someone who has enough interest in your mission, they'll open their home and provide hospitality. Now, if you cannot find anyone, of course, you really will not be able to do any building up of someone to carry on, but there's no point in continuing if you're not finding someone to disciple. You remember what he told them? If no one is the least bit interested in your mission, shake the dust off your feet. We don't have the luxury of just going through the routine and carrying on programs when no one is being discipled because our vision is always reaching the world. And that's always uppermost. Even before we get anything started, we have in mind choosing someone who wants to learn. 
someone who will be with us, someone who is motivated by that love of God in our heart to do the same with someone else. And so the reproduction is already assured because this is in your thinking from the very onset of your ministry. And of course, before he leaves them, he makes it very clear uh, that they are to carry on what he has been doing himself with them. That we call the Great Commission. Now you can see where you are able to begin that ministry, to have a part in that ministry, involve those that are close to you in some way where they can feel important, where they can have the excitement of doing ministry, and you make use of their specific gifts. We're all wired differently. We can't all be involved in preaching in the pulpit. Thankfully, there are few that can do that. We can't all be involved in being a Sunday school teacher. There are many, though, that have that great gift. But the Great Commission, you see, is not particularly dependent upon gifts. It is a command. And whatever our gift, however God has made us, we can be useful in ministry. We can all do something. I think of a riding academy down in Texas that advertises they have a horse to suit everyone's taste. You may have heard about it. And they say that if you're fat, they have fat horses. <laughs> if you're skinny, they have skinny horses. If you're fast, they have fast horses. If you're slow, they have slow horses. But if you don't know how to ride at all, they've got horses that have never been ridden before. <laughs> now, I don't know what your taste is, but there's a horse you can ride. And more to the point, there's a horse everybody can ride when it comes to the work of God. God has a way of using us all in a unique way for the work of the kingdom. I know my wife is here and embarrasses me to mention it, but she's wired differently than I am. But she has a marvelous gift that has certainly been a great asset to my ministry. Her gift is hospitality, called a gift of helps in the Bible. And so from the time that we were married, our home has been kind of like a hotel. Strangers come and go. Hardly a week passes without someone being at our table who is a friend, someone that we want to entertain. And it's all because of her gift. And she is a queen when it comes to making people feel comfortable in our home. Our children grew up with this, having strangers at our table so often especially if there was somebody going through town that I felt would be an inspiration to my kids. I'd try to get to them quickly and ask them out for, for dinner. If not dinner, lunch. If not lunch, breakfast. And I discovered big people don't mind eating with a little person if you get to them first. And so my kids grew up with having some of these great stalwarts of the face sitting at our table so they could talk with him, ask questions. But it's all because of my dear wife who has that gift. Now sometimes people will twist my arm and ask me to convince her to say something and she will do it if I persuade her, but only with, with reluctance. Now I've learned not to ever criticize her message because at first she would write it out and then go over it practice it, 
And I might make a comment how you might change a sentence or something, but after the first time, I learned never do it. She would say, that's the trouble. When I get something done, you see something wrong with it. I've learned my lesson. I just want to rejoice however she does it. It's always good. Better than I could ever do. But every one of us have a way of ministering for Christ. And those that you get to know who've been with you for a while, you begin to discover where they have special gifts, where they are talented, where they can do something superior to what you probably could ever do yourself. And that is part of disciple making, getting people involved, giving them something to do. Certainly, when it comes to sharing our faith, we can all give a testimony. Hasn't it been beautiful here in these meetings to see these wonderful witnesses that have shared their own experience with Christ? That's really a high point for me, to give a word of testimony. And you can encourage these new believers not to be reluctant in telling the story of how Christ became real to them. You can also find uh, ways for them to get involved in following up some new believer. Someone who comes to Christ should never be left alone. Yes, we encourage them to come to church and certainly that will be a blessing. And hopefully to get involved in the Sunday school. But also they need some personal relationship with a little group that can meet with them, or for you to go by and see them and see how they're coming along. If you're a few steps ahead of a follower, then you're a leader. And leaders are trained in ministry as we get involved, as we exercise what God has given us for Him. Delegation is finally spelled out by Jesus at the end of the way. These disciples had been with Him for about three years, but He wants them to know that though He leaves, their work is now going to take on a new dimension of joy and blessing. They're going to carry on. And so He delegates that authority to go in His name now, in the name of the Son of God, and announce the good news, the Savior has come, and not only to introduce the gospel, those who believe you continue to work with and share and encourage and correct. If we would be more faithful in this, we wouldn't have so many falling away after initial beginning. The great weakness of the church is the lack of discipleship which begins in just initial follow-up with new believers, being not right there beside them, not leaving them alone to go out into a world that's continually counteracting their own influence for Christ. You need to be there to answer their questions, to lift them up, and to see that they're continuing on. Those first duties are just routine tasks, but as they grow in knowledge and in grace, they can be enlarged. One who was a member of a Sunday school class, you notice they seem to be insightful, they seem to be alert to the lesson uh, message. And so you have a prospect another Sunday school teacher beginning, of course, as an assistant, but finally becoming a full-fledged teacher of a class. Some of them may be deacons. Some of them may become elders of the church. But everyone in some way will be involved in ministry because we are all ministering servants. And our effectiveness in the Great Commission will largely be dependent on the way those that follow us themselves get involved, where they are gifted, where they have some skill, where perhaps they have the education or the training. But in one respect, 
they're just like us. They can make disciples. That is the point where all of us agree. It's not dependent upon your training in some formal education or upon your position of authority in the church. It's dependent upon your willingness just to grow in grace and follow Christ. The principle of delegation. And as this is being implemented, there will be a continual stream of new leaders coming into various aspects of the church ministry, not just in the program of the church, but in the outreach of the church in many, many different ways as you serve for Jesus. But where this is being practiced, you need to understand another principle I call supervision. 